You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Well, I thought there was an interesting story this week, a really interesting story, actually, which is the Pink Floyd's, I suppose you'd call it, well, a charity record, but it's kind of peace anthem, isn't it, that they put out. And I thought it was fascinating for lots of people. I mean, I thought it was one of the best and most dignified and the least self-promotional and the most appropriately pitched examples of one of those records I'd ever heard. I thought it was amazing. You know the story, right? You know the story of how it came about? I do, yeah. Well, it started with, uh, well, I mean, Dave Gilmore's got Ukrainian relations, hasn't he? He's got in-laws. He has. I think it's, it's, His so daughter-in-law is Ukrainian. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So and she's been it, getting her mum out of the country. Yeah, Poland, yeah, Sweden, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So he's probably been following it even more closely than most people. Yeah. Um, he was playing. He was playing a benefit in 2015, I think, for the Belarus uh, Free Theatre, backed by this Ukrainian band Boombox. So he met the singer Andrei Klivniuk, and uh, somebody alerted him to the fact that Andrei Klivniuk, who with, with Boombox was touring America, cancelled the tour when the war broke out, came back to Ukraine, signed up, um, and before he was. Uh, hospitalized with a with a shrapnel wound he went into a square in in, in kiev in, by st sophia cathedral and did this absolutely fantastic version a cappella of of a world war one protest song called the red viburnum in the meadow an old ukrainian folk song it's really really moving and david gilmore saw this and uh took the vocal and created a pink floyd song around it and then recorded and then yeah, recorded it with with Nick Mason and Guy Pratt, and uh, who's the bassist who's been with Nick and Sorny, yeah, Sorny, and uh, and then played it to uh, Andre, and uh, who immediately gave his permission, obviously, for him to use it, and they released it. And I think it's I think it's fantastic, actually. I it's it's, it's, really, it's very really good because it's a really good old folk song, isn't it? <laughs> those tunes, those tunes last for a reason, and um, it's kind of a it doesn't really turn into a Pink Floyd song. I mean, you know. He, he plays guitar in between it, doesn't he? Yeah. Really? And it sounds kind of like Pink Floyd. Like Pink Floyd was sound if they applied themselves to put in the backing on a, you know, on a, exactly. on a Ukrainian folk the song. Signature guitar sounds. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it certainly really works. I mean, I, I don't know whether these things nowadays... I don't know really what, what's the kind of objective. It used to be... I mean, th this is obviously, you know, money going towards... Um, you know, helping people distressed as a consequence of this. Uh, obviously, there are millions of them. Um, you know, and I don't know. I don't know whether these kind of records raise money in the, the way that they, they used to. You know, in the days when we all went into war, was right? whatever yeah. we paid for a band aid record a or whatever. Record. It is. So there was a lot of cash generated quite quickly, um, and I don't know if these things do it in the same way. And I, I don't know. I'd also I don't know whether you, you you really sort of raise consciousness of these things like you used to in the past, because when you've got a war like this, people don't have to remind us of it. You know what I mean? It's there. It's every morning when you no, wake you're up. You're absolutely maybe. assaulted from every angle by news it, stories about it. You can't it, escape them. You know? It is social media. It's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the kind of it's sort of interesting that it makes you think about you know, rocks attitude to these kind of things or response to these kind of things. Because it always used to be in the nature of a reminder, didn't it? You know what I mean? That even when Vietnam was going on, it wasn't really coming into living rooms night by night, not live like that, you know what I mean? So there was a sense of reminding people that this thing was going on and it was going on generally a long, long way away. So they needed to be reminded. Whereas this is very different. And I, I'll tell you, the other thing is that, uh, you know, this is such a sort of naked act of aggression that um, that the normal kind of responses to it, the normal pop, pop responses to it sort of don't work. And I think I was saying to you a couple of weeks ago, has Give Peace a Chance ever sounded weedier than no, it, it sounds? sounds so hollow. It, it sounds, sounds so, hollow. so ridiculous. You it know is. I mean? It's so unconnected with reality, isn't it? It is a reality because, because the attitude of, of sort of pop music to, to war has always been, hey, guys, chill. You know yeah. What I mean? yeah. Take, Look take at it us. another way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I need that, to do this. <laughs> this is 
not They're appropriate. All be friends. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely not appropriate in this case. And as you said in the in the story here, you know, this is this is about a, a, a Ukrainian musician who went to serve. Went back, you know I mean? There he is in, in this the is, square with a machine this is, gun. This is genuine danger. You know, yeah, this is yeah, appalling yeah. danger. This is not the clash posing in Belfast. You know what I mean? This yeah. is. You know, this, this is real for a whole generation of people. And um, so I think, you know, the Pink Floyd doing this has kind of elegantly sidestepped that problem of how to write their own song that express their feelings towards Completely. this. Completely, it's not sung by the, they begin and, and the other to. thing about the Pink Floyd is that, is that they're, they're not, the, the characters, the individual members of the Pink Floyd, aren't that important, really. Do you know, no, what I mean? no. you know their, their music has always been a kind of soundtrack, and this is a soundtrack to that particular clip of the war footage, and uh, and it's in- incredibly bracing and incredibly moving. But I mean, most other acts, you kind of have to see them, and it's their personalities that matter. So that's a real advantage, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, Julian Lennon. We were talking about this yesterday. Julian Lennon's uh, re-recorded Imagine, and this is mean, just no, what the world has been waiting for. No disrespect, but I mean, it just the whole video is just an incredibly expensively made thing of a of a of a, of a camera swinging around among a load of candles and eventually a lighting on Julian Lennon singing his father's song, and you just think this does seem immensely self-interested. I'm sorry, it just comes across that way. I know it's not meant to be. But no, yeah. well, that that is certainly the way it come, when yeah. comes over. And I was thinking, I tell you what, I was thinking about in the, in the light of all this. I was thinking, you know, the, the most the most eloquent use of a, of a of a pop song to make a comment about a war that I ever witnessed was in it was April two thousand three, and I was in Sacramento, California, and that was the day. Um, when I don't know if you remember it, when American forces entered Baghdad and pulled down the statue of Saddam Hussein, yeah, and it, which was an event that was contrived entirely for the American TV networks, you know, they had no strategic significance, you know, it didn't mean anything in Baghdad, it didn't mean anything to the war, but this was a good was the thing image to be able to. Yeah. That was what they wanted. And it took an awful lot of doing, actually. So I was in a hotel room and uh, watching 24-hour news. And, uh, you know, to, to shift this statue, to pull it down to cranes and all kinds of things, it wasn't done easily. You know? But eventually, and the American networks got their shot, you know. And the American news networks were absolutely full of this, this kind of moment of triumph, you know, this ending moment, apparently. And that night... I went to see Bruce Springsteen, who was playing in Sacramento. And America was kind of full of it. You know, America was was buzzing with this. And I thought, well, he's going to have to say something or uh, whatever. And he came out. And before he played anything, I can't remember what he said, but he made some kind of comment about about the, the the goings on and Bruce Springsteen is too bright not to realize that there will be those amongst his audience who have one view of these things and those among his audience who probably have a totally different view of it I don't know, I don't know you know anyway he talked a little bit about it and then he started the first song which was Creedence Clearwater Revival's Who'll Stop the Rain Very which good. is a song that is <clears throat> it's not openly about war at all, but it's just basically whole stop the rain. And and I thought that was a really powerful statement to make about a war. It is because wars not, are really easy to start. You're not being direct, you know. That's... Really, wars are really easy to start. Yeah, and they're terribly difficult to stop. And 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 didn't that prove to be the case with what went on in Iraq? It did. And will not or also prove to be the case with this. You this know. seems absolutely interminable, doesn't it? And, and so, well, it's early days, you know. And uh, so that, I that did think that was interesting, that the use of, of a song that didn't have any, uh, you know, uh, on its surface didn't appear to be about war at all, in that context, in that context. said something very powerful indeed. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So we were talking recently about the bloke I bumped into at a party who told me he had 25 big country albums, and I thought that was extraordinary. And so, I But he t- miscalculated, didn't he? 
I miscalculated. He came back to me yeah, because he was so amazed at the response to, to the claims of 25 that he went back and did a count. And he says, no, I don't have 25. I've got 38. <laughs> Astonishing. Country albums. And so I kept this going on Twitter. It turns out that's nothing. You nothing. know what I mean? So I, saw, Roger, I saw all that. Roger responses. Millington. You remember, remember Roger is a Patreon supporter. Yeah, yeah we had him on the He's one of our ba- yeah. birthday guests. And he's a big Gary Newman fan. And he, he has counted up and he has over 100 Gary Newman albums. It's fantastic. Uh, John Innes, who we also, I think, as a, as a birthday guest, who is a big Loudon Wainwright yeah. fan, uh, to the extent that he even that he'd even bid for the Loudon Wainwright, um, you know, tin helmet that Loudon Wainwright wore on what is it, therapy? What is that's it? Right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And he's got twenty four Loudon Wainwright albums plus three box sets. Uh, but <laughs> this is what I like. Paul Vincent's wife, not even Paul Vincent, Paul Vincent's wife has 53 Bill Nelson albums. My God. 53. How many of those are legal then? No, I think, you see, I will come back to this in a second. I, uh, Poppies from a Tray has 40 Pete Hamill records, and that's not even counting Van de Graaff Generator records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. additional to that. And Tim McMillan claims he has 227 Kiss and Kiss related albums. How many of those would you listen to? <laughs> well, <laughs> well you have to skip through them, but I mean, my God. But he, it's just, the, you know, the fact is that people keep going, people keep making records, people keep stay, stay fans of them. Yeah. And therefore they just keep buying records, don't they? You know, you and I are so old that we think of careers as being, you know, I don't know. 10 albums. Of him. That's, That's right. And then, then we don't realize there's still people are still putting out stuff long after this group is defunct. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Gary Stafford says he has 40 Simple Minds albums, but, and here is here is the point that I think many people will identify with, he only listens to the first five. You see, that's Absolutely. The, that's the great The rest truth. is there to make you feel good. <laughs> you can stroke you- them occasionally. <laughs> And uh, Kieran Perry, I don't really know much about Guided by Voices, but um, they're they're very uh, prolific to the extent that he's he, he guesses there have probably been four Guided by Voices albums released this week in the average week. He's maybe exaggerating a little bit. For, uh, who have I got here? Fraser Allen has got 41 John Cale CDs. We somehow I don't find as amazing as the fact that Anthony A has 20 Ringo Starr albums. Yeah, really, that seems extraordinary to me. <laughs> don't you think? But then again... How many different versions of Photograph do you want to have? I don't okay, know. Okay, but I'm, I'm going to guess, and I'm no expert on the catalogue of Ringo Starr, every Ringo Starr album will have some little interesting story about it, won't it? It'll have some kind of spin... They, they, It'll they, have something know, interesting on it, won't it? It will. There'll it be will. Terry Brooker on it. There'll be Peter Frampton on it. You know, there'll be Jack Bruce on it or something, won't there? It won't be just Ringo went into the studio and knocked yeah. out an album. You know, they never were like that. Well, I guess the first one was, what's the first one? A sentimental Journey, wasn't yeah. it? The, that, uh, you know, kind of Big songs seller. that he used to sing in the pub. Uh, and uh, and then he, in the the, the country, country West one, didn't he? Boko. Buku okay, the blues. blues. That's right. Uh, uh, maybe with Pete Drake. So they, and then then of course there were the hits. You know we forget that. You know Ringo Starr. You know the Richard Perry produced album that had two or three number one records yeah, on it, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just having a drink of water. Um, so you know it's just amazing how how um, how faithful people are to their favourites. You know and how they keep on. But also the market knows that if there's enough completists who have to buy everything, as we do in this house for Dylan still, who have to own it, then uh, you might as well keep putting it out because you're guaranteed a sale, aren't you? I mean, there's going to be someone who's going to buy it, quite a few people. You see, it's not, you're not a fan anymore. You're a subscriber, aren't you? Yeah. That's basically how it works. You're a subscriber. You're a supporter. It's like being a footballer. It's it's a football analogy. You know, you, you almost stop being a fan, but you're just locked into it. There's nothing you can do. And it's like being a football fan. It's more pain than pleasure. Yeah. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit 
from this next bit. Gavin Hogg, who's a regular listener to this podcast and also does uh, the Giddy Carousel of Pop uh, podcast, which is dedicated to uh, celebrating smash hits. <laughs> he sent me this the, he was a reminder of that. I think I've seen this before, actually, but it's always good to be reminded uh, that there is a, a stall selling Donna kebabs that glories in the name of, over to you, Mark. Of, of Jason Donovan. And in fact, <laughs> Jason Donovan himself actually went to the stall and posed for a photograph not long ago. Jason Donovan. It's so, so good. Yeah, so it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because we've got loads of examples of this coming up. And they're, they're pretty much mainly just small businesses, aren't they? You know yeah. what I mean? They're, they're not huge franchises or anything like that. But if you're a small business person, you're running a window cleaner bit business or a you know, Donald Kebab seller, whatever, it's always worth giving yourself a name that is a kind of humorous spin on a pop star's name because there's a sort of publicity value, isn't it? It's really? great, but well, look at that. Exactly. People take That's pictures of it. And uh, and that's been going on. I mean, that, those kind of puns have been going on forever. I have to tell you that we have, I've just dug it out from the kitchen. We have that. It's a sausage that? pepper mill. <laughs> of course. And that's just, you know, why do we buy that? Because you have to, don't you? Someone's invented a Sarge and Pepper Mill. No, do. I think they're great. Because he talked about how there was, uh, who, who have we got? There's loads of really good ones, haven't there? Well, uh, I've got a few here that have been sent was... in on Twitter. Jackie Wicks tells me that there is a place called the Asian Grub Foundation. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, isn't it? It's very good. Barbara uh, Streisand, Barbara and Harris Smith from <laughs> John Hughes. The oh right, yes. Somebody, ha- hairdressers says, are always a favourite, isn't it? Alan on. says, "Sent him one called, uh, which is just the the, the the slogan on the back of this fan is ground controlled by Gardner Tom, <laughs> isn't it?" And so, and so Johnny Walker said, "There's a. I mean, this isn't the rock rock and roll thing, but there's a there's a, a Napoleon Bo- boiler parts." Is a plumber's merchant <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Tim Collins has sent that. My fave was from Russell Clark. He said it was a Greek restaurant called I Should Be Souvlaki. <laughs> that is genuinely <laughs> brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Tim Collins has sent a sign for um, a, a, a kind of uh, wines and spirits retailer. Which is called Amy's Wine House. Um, oh, he's the guy who sent the one of the snack bar called Brimful of Rasher. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Isn't it? There is a pizza place near the University of Connecticut called Sergeant Pepperoni. Of course, there is. Of course, there is. And uh, there is a fish shop somewhere that uh, David Walker sent, which is called Codrophenia. <laughs> no, that's good. That's really good. And um, and what about Hawkfall, who sent that thing from Australia? Was it does uh, there was a a cafe called Toast Faced Griller, (laughs) which is really good? Is this Ghost Face Uh, Killer? Our old old chum Alan Probert has sent a picture, uh, which I presume presumably from the UK of two shops next to each other. And one's called the pet shop, and then the shop next door is called Boys. I know that's fantastic. So that uh, Lovely, that works. That works for absolutely. Lino good. Ritchie, Uto <laughs> Ryan sent in. Um, D- Donna, a, a, a donor kebab shop called Donor Summer. Oh, and our valet. I saw that one, and there was a lovely one from Ian B who sent in one of Father Treads. Our tires are so cheap, it's a sin. I mean, that's genius, isn't it? <laughs> As you say, they just publicise themselves. This is from the the grand tradition of of, of the florists called um, called florist gump. I mean, those kind of things just work, don't they? People just absolutely you feel fond of uh, immediately. You do, you do. You, you want to go and like, give them your custom. You like to feel that any any business that's got a jokey name like that is uh, is very good at delivering whatever service it is that it offers. Yeah, you know? yeah. you'd hate to think that that was a joke as well. Um, but no, long may this tradition continue. Uh, thanks for that suggestion, Gavin. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Okay, well, we're delighted to be joined by our birthday Patreon guest. Uh, once again, our old friend uh, Chuck Lonson out in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Is that where you're, you're joining us from? Uh, that's where I am, smack at my desk in the office in Savannah. We've we've got a terrible cliched picture of Southern lawyers here, which is culled from loads and loads of films. Do you actually own a white suit? (laughs) Do you you have a slow-moving fan? (laughs) 
Yeah, I'll I'll give you a couple of clues. I I do own a seersucker suit. Well, there you go. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you gotta have down here just because of the heat, if not anything else. But uh, I have no fan. But most Southern lawyers don't have a Ministry of Silly Walks clock. Oh, oh that's very good. <laughs> it's certain times of the How day. How brilliant with uh, the legs! With the, that's a br- that's a really clever. So it actually yeah, works. So it's a work. The legs kind of kick up. Yeah, yeah it's very, very good. good. Yeah, this is my clock. So this is uh, John Cleese and various poses. Yeah, (laughs) that's very good. So what are you doing for your birthday, Chuck? Uh, My birthday was this past Monday, and I went to court. Do what I do Uh, most days, uh, but did have a lovely dinner with my dogs. Okay. Oh, nice. Good. And then you've got an agenda question. Yeah. Sorry, anything you'd like to throw you want to discuss? Yes. I did. Well, I had. Two things. I do have an agenda item, but I also, you know, when we had the birthday meeting the last time, I had only been watching the uh, YouTube channel and, and the podcast for a couple months. So I didn't know fully. And I was asked what my thought the greatest record of all time was. And I assumed it had to be more of a pop suit, pop record. But since that time, I've seen I was interested in other types of music, particularly jazz, David. All right. And I have to make a quick amendment to the greatest <laughs> record of all. That's brilliant. <laughs> that's so people are going to use those correct their mistakes. mistakes. That's right. Correct mistake. I was a crazy, last... crazy youngster at the time, and now I'm older and wiser. Go on. My my criteria, if you recall from a year ago, was a record that you just keep turning it over, never right. take it off, just keep yeah. listening to. But now I realize that the true test of the greatest record ever should really be the reason any boy picks up an instrument or puts on a record, and that's to impress and hopefully undress a girl. <laughs> and the one record that I have that is an absolute guarantee for that, oh, frankly, should be printed bold on a claim. little <laughs> blue disc. Okay, all right. Is Don oh, Coltrane John and Johnny Hartman. Johnny Hartman. I okay. don't know that record at all. What did, what this, did Johnny Hartman this play? This is... Johnny's a singer, beautiful, All right, beautiful okay. voice. All right. And it's McCoy Tyner on piano, right. Robin Jones on drum. I mean, it's just fantastic. Six songs. Every one of them is just dripping. It's uh, what did Will Ferrell say in uh, Anchorman? Baby making music. I mean, <laughs> baby making music. That's right. As you, he pulls his You put of, this uh, on, you'll be changing his diapers. Electric flute out of his sleeve. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, that, well, well, well. I'm sure we're all grateful for yeah. that. Yeah. that I recommend it more highly. Okay, yeah. very and good. And the other thing, leading into our agenda item, I told you all last time that the best concert I ever went to was Simon and Garfunkel's reunion at Central Park, which is still a fantastic one. And for the money, which was a free concert, the best value ever. <laughs> but for money, I've actually paid the best concert you can ever see is Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, really? <laughs> God, that's a strange choice. Weird Al is, uh, James Brown, forgive me, but the hardest working man in show business. The really? The costume changes, the bands, he he puts on one hell of a show. But thinking about Weird Al got me into my agenda item, which is guilty pleasures. Right. Which is basically the things you do enjoy listening to but don't want to admit it. So Weird Al's kind of along those lines. Everybody, when you get right down with people and start asking them and you mentioned Weird Al, everybody loves Weird Al. I mean, how yeah, can a big hit the with his hysterical. Michael Jackson pastiche. I can remember it really well. Oh, just well, He's had loads in the States, hasn't he? I yeah. mean, it's one oh, it's after the other amazing. in the States. They are, but it was so only that, one here. So who are your others? Well, I, you had a guest the other day on the podcast talking about the history of British comedy, comedians and comedy oh, yeah, albums. Yeah, yeah. And I have a bunch of old ones Probably one of the best comedy albums ever made. But oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. Want, That's yeah. a work of genius. Work of genius. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And funny enough, he was my uncle's best friend growing up in Chicago. They were oh, good. Bob Newhart. And of course, Bob Newhart's still with us, isn't he? Still with us. My uncle's guy. I asked my aunt one time. She said, oh, yeah, we used to go out on the weekends with Bob. And I said, was he funny? And he's like, oh, of course he was funny, but you had to be sitting right next to him to hear it because he was so shy and quiet. 
Right. No, I couldn't hear what he was saying. Well, he only he got into show over... business completely by, by accident, didn't he? He had a career, hadn't he? And it became... yeah, he was an accountant. Yes, he was, he was an accountant. And uh, my uncle worked for uh, 3M or one of those big companies, and they were, they grew up together with buddies. But that is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, but guilty pleasure. So along those lines, it's some music that combines an aspect of comedy with it. So. There are two groups I want to bring to your attention as my guilty pleasures, and I'd love to hear y'all. First is, I don't know how popular he was there, but this is my Kinky Friedman for Governor t-shirt. Oh, wow. Very good. Kinky Friedman ran for Governor of Texas back in 2006. I'll tell you, I I went out for a drink with Kinky Friedman in New York City in uh, uh, the mid-80s. And, uh, yes. And I've still, I've got, I've got, I've got King of Friedman's uh, Sold American somewhere, which has got the famous track on it, Ride'em Jew Boy, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, Ride'em Jew a- Boy, the, old, <laughs> well, the only country and Western song about the Holocaust. God, not getting many plays now, probably. <laughs> not at all. There, there is a terrific uh, tribute album to Kinky called Pearls in the Snow, and Willie Nelson sings Ride'em Jew Boy. Well, there you go. Oh, right. they, if Willie does it, it's got to be, it's got to be all right. No, it's, it's a, a great, great comedy. Movie. Is a, 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 a very often you know, you watch old old comedy programs. That you think you could not do that. So, so often, that. it's incredible. <laughs> you you wouldn't even be allowed to think about doing. No, no, it. You know, I can't believe they can even repeat The Office now. The Office seems so so outrageous. But, he, but, but, but don't you think it's a bit, I mean, it's a bit of a shame in the sense that, I mean, you obviously can't bring about the past and so forth, but but being edgy and slightly offensive used to be part of comedy. Well, yeah. nowadays it's not. No, it's, the whole thing was to get you, get you slapped. And if you upset people, people accept they were upset and it was kind of, you know, almost their fault, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're not yeah. being tolerant enough. Well, yeah. you know, Kinky, one of Kinky's big songs was Get Your Biscuits in the Oven and Your Buns in the Bed. And the Buns That's in right. the Bed. That's right. <laughs> and that got him named Bill Chauvinist of the Year by the National Organization for Women. Yeah, and of course they ain't making Jews like Jesus anymore. They ain't making Jews yeah. like Jesus anymore, of course. God, yes. Terrific. <laughs> so the one other group that I want to bring to y'all's attention um, is a bluegrass music base, but they do comedy. Got two of their records. They're called the oh. Clever Leads. Oh, don't know. It's basically a guy who is a stand-up comedian in Branson, Missouri, where all the old country singers open yeah, their ears yeah. and go to the yeah. choir. He was a stand up there, but a bit of a musician, and he grabbed some other the musicians who played at the various theaters and created a fictional family band. But basically, they take rap music, rock music, anything but country and bluegrass and set it to bluegrass, kind of like uh, Weird Al does. Yeah. But you can find them on YouTube. Absolutely hysterical. Actually, very good musicians. But to hear, I sent uh, Alex a couple that I've recorded at one of their concerts, but uh, to hear them do Red Hot Chili Peppers or uh, <laughs> Justin Bieber or Flo Rida in uh, bluegrass form is wonderfully entertaining. Amazing. My children are mortified every time I try and put the disc on or talk about <laughs> wanting to go see the Cleverlands. So that is, that, those are my guilty players. Oh, those are great. great. Thank yes. you. I mean, I, I don't know what I'd suggest in terms of comedy stuff. You know, I, I still find the same things funny I found <laughs> funny years ago. It's very often you started laughing years ago, and it's the very idea of them that keeps you laughing. You know, that uh, there's a famous British TV a radio program, Round the Horn, back in the days. You know, this is like in the 1960s. And uh, it always had one sketch uh, every week featuring Kenneth Horn and Hugh Paddock, who always played a, a couple of, uh, of gay guys. But this is before the word gay was in kind of common parlance at all. And it was just basically the same gag, wasn't it, Mark? Week after yeah, week. Well, Hello, I'm Julie, and this is my friend Sandy. You know what I mean? And it's the very idea of the repetition of the gag is hugely funny. And it's kind of like your Cleverleys and your, and your Bluegrass, you know. You know, it was like Alex. Alex is a, a distinguished past playing in a ukulele orchestra, which works in the same sense. 
Here's a song by Madonna or Duke Ellington or whatever, or Mozart, but it's done on the no, ukulele. On the ukulele, which makes it hilarious. It's, <laughs> and it's just straight away, straight away is funny, you know. I, I have to say, I'm, a, I'm not a, you know, I, I, I don't buy the guilty pleasures thing that people often indulge in. They often say, oh, ELO is my guilty pleasure or whatever. They always say, they always pick something that isn't edgy as their guilty pleasure, as if they think they ought to like edgy. You know what I mean? Whereas anything else, you know, is is different. I don't think it's any different at all. You know? No, I don't think so either. I agree with um, you. You know, I like loads of sentimental stuff. Um, I you can know. remember when I was at the NME really liking Sheila B. Devotion Spacer and Wishing on a Star by Rose Royce and Love Don't Live Here Anymore and things like that. And that at the time, they were all writing about Crispy Ambulance and Joy Division. <laughs> and, you know, and I can remember not daring to say that I thought these were really, I thought those disco, some late 70s disco records were amazing and I still do actually. Yeah, and absolutely. Coming, they're produced by people like Nile Rogers. You know? Well, absolutely. And, uh, do you know Sheila B. Devotion's King of the World? That's a brilliant record. Yes, I do. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant yeah. record. That was the that was the follow-up to Spacer. Yeah. Um and the, uh, yeah. The fun, go on. I was gonna say the funny thing about comedy albums, about putting a joke on an album, and you listen to it over and over and keep laughing at the same joke. There I went to see a comedian I really like named Dennis Regan, and people would call out old routines of his to do to him. He's like you know, there's supposed to be an element of surprise to the joke, oh, really? to the punchline. Yeah. <laughs> but when you already know the punchline, why do you still want to hear it? There's, because it's so damn funny. I'll keep laughing. That's so true. My father I and I used to... Monty Python's Flying Circus at a rock festival when I was about 18. It was the same thing. They came on and they just did the parrot sketch and all that. And the audience were just shouting out the lines with them, as you would do yeah. singing along with the chorus of a song. It's exactly the same experience. Very bizarre. My was father a, and I would watch old WC Field movies and and Monty Python, and my mother would walk in and we'd be laughing our heads off, and she'd be, "What are y'all watching?" And we'd tell her, "How many times have y'all seen that damn movie?" And we're like, fifteen, it. twenty. So we're still yeah. Yeah, yeah, laughing yeah. like it's the first time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very oh, good. Well. Very well. good. Um, Look out for the, the best of sellers. That's worth hearing if you haven't heard. That yeah, are you, yeah, are you familiar with the Peter best Selfers? of sellers? Has got a track on it. It's about yeah. um, about a, a, a. It's so clever. It's about the idea that pop careers were over very early. It's about this guy. He says, uh, uh, you know, he says, uh, my, my, my curly hair is getting thin. It's all those women, all that women and wine. He said, uh, you know, I'm coming up for nine. <laughs> it's this idea that this, this pop star's career is going to be washed up. Uh, yeah, you know, it's fantastic. I love yeah. Peter Sellers. What's yeah. what's the name of the town he has? Is it on that album? Warsham or Warsham? Oh, some he, he, Bal- he, 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 Gateway he, he, to the South? Balham. Yes. Balham. 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 Here's the Honey Silver Tea. Honey Silver Tea. Yeah. It's, yeah. American, it's American travelogue, isn't it? It's we're, really we're now traveling funny. Balham. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, look, Chuck, it's been lovely to talk to you. And, um, well, you had your birthday. Um, but it's yeah, probably, it a w- probably a week of, se- se- uh, of uh, festivities, I'm sure. And um, what are you be doing What are you doing this weekend? <laughs> well, if you, if you recall, Lane, who I live with, works in the TV and movie industry. She has purchased a whole bunch of costuming equipment. And we are renting it out to a movie that is being filmed here in Savannah. And I'm going to be uh, wiping down costume clothing racks so that some other movie can rent a hundred racks for us. Uh-huh. Sounds like well, that. you have all the fun. <laughs> <laughs> the word podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. We were recording a, a birthday uh, special the other day with one of our uh Patron supporters, uh, Carl Trosclair, who was really, really good. Really, I, I listen. So many of these people have been they are, really, they're, really good. They're just I've, brilliant. I've, I've found uh, so many of them absolutely fascinating. Um, really, really Carl really looks Yes, he yeah. was, wasn't he? Carl had really, th- Carl had really prepared, hadn't he? Carl had really done his homework. He'd absolutely thought it through. He'd gone back and checked the dates to see if they were what he remembered, and they found that they weren't. You know what I mean? So he, oh yeah, no, really, he really researched it. He remembered that, gigs he'd seen, and he'd gone yes. back and found the set list to check that he remembered it was on that day and what songs were played, and he yes. had them printed out the set list. He was really and fantastic. And he had uh, direct first-hand experience of the West Runton Pavilion, didn't he? Which is yes, always, which he said always was very welcome. 
describe that a kind of uh, a kind of uh, a, a corrugated asbestos tomb or something. I can't remember now, but something. It's it's marvelous grandeur. But I thought he made a really good point about big in Japan. He said, oh, God, "I think the contenders." Thing. Was yeah, that go on? No, he said, go on. He said. Uh, he said uh, he thought that they were contenders for being one of the most influential groups of all time. I mean, that's a slight exaggeration when you compare it with the, the great artistic giants. But it was a really good point because you think of the members of Big in Japan, all of them, pretty much all of them went to do yeah, really significant yeah, things. Give us the background because, I mean, a lot of people won't know of Big in Japan. Well, Big Japan, Japan formed in uh, in Liverpool in about, I suppose, would it be Late 78, 79? Something like that, yeah, yeah. And uh, just with a load of people who were around the time, kind of scene makers. Scene makers, on, yeah, yes. Went on to do interesting things. Bill Drummond was in the group, who obviously went on to uh, co-found Zoo Records and KLF and everything. Jane Casey, who I think finished up as the artistic director during you know Liverpool, uh, uh, Liverpool. Well, isn't it Crimfields and all these yes. kind of you know the huge name in the in the world yeah. of kind of dance music and festivals and so yeah, yeah 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 yeah. Ian Brody, of course, was in Lightning Seeds and wrote you know um, uh, the the great football anthem Do No Jour. Clive Langer, who went on to produce Madness and Dexys, and Elvis Costello and Morrissey. I mean, incredibly talented from Deaf School. Holly Johnson. I mean, that's a story in itself. Holly Johnson was a member. <laughs> Budgie was on drums. I mean, that's and fantastic. I said to him, "This is the book. Surely. It is a book. It, it really or, is, or, or, or a Belf. documentary, or a documentary, or something it like is. that." Because it's the idea of all those people being in a group that was really unsuccessful, <laughs> and then all going on individually to do really successful things. I mean. They were, and they never tried to be terribly successful, did they? Really, you know. I, I saw, really. them, I saw them at Eric's. Do I remember seeing them uh, playing "I'm Sticking to You" because I'm made out of glue at Eric's, supporting. God, I can't remember Elvis Costello probably. Um, it and, is that uh, wonderful and, irony that people talk about being bigger than the sum of their parts and all that. These were infinitely group was infinitely smaller, wasn't it? The sum of its parts yes. went on to be fantastically successful. And so talking talking of scene makers, uh, as you mentioned a moment ago, and, and we note the passing of a scene maker who I don't I never met, which is kind of amazing, really. Um, Andy Wickham. Andy Wickham Andy. was a great obit in the Times about him. What well, was such a good story? It made me think that's another movie, actually. <laughs> yes. movie. This is a guy, he's a public school boy, kicked out of school at the age of whatever he was, 17, for just generally bad behavior. And then he finished up um working in, in Soho, meeting Charlie Watts. And Charlie Watts invited him to come and see the Rolling Stones at Eel Pie Island, and they were just taking off. He then got a job as a PR, and he did the PR for um for the Stones and Marion Faithful and Herman's Hermits and uh, Freddie and the Dreamers. And uh, Chrissy Shrimpton was his secretary. And then Mo Austin discovered him and met him and was really impressed with him and, and signed him up to Warner Brothers. And so then he became the kind of house hippie. And it's interesting because those are the days when those were businesses run by kind of businessmen. Yeah, they were. Oh, and Warner, they Warner Brothers no particularly. Real- yeah, Warner brothers particularly because they were they were all Frank Sinatra's people. You know that, yeah. that's what they were. They were pros. They were really good. Yeah, but they knew what they didn't know, and so they knew how important it was to get people like Andy Wickham, you know, to go and out also and people who could recommend speak acts. fluent kind of musician who yes. could actually speak. Because at that stage, musicians were very very skeptical and very wary of kind of straights and suits and men in you know men in ties and things. and so and so really Andy Wickham was the kind of house hippie wasn't he he was the one who went out and took the drugs with them and he's the one who wore the the, the kipper ties and the flared trousers you know and they signed him for two hundred dollars a week I think which made him quite a lot of money at the time and he signed I think he was the person who brought well Mark he was Morrison a, to the he was the he was the he was the kind of link that brought in you know Joni Mitchell Joni Mitchell <laughs> he yeah. was the guy who said to Warner Brothers you know. I think she's rather good. Yeah, know. I think you should look at her. You um, know, young, uh, I think Graham Parsons. Uh, so Emily many. Lou Harris, and Jethro yeah. Tull. And of course, the amazing thing was, I used to see his name on album covers years ago, and I used to think, oh, I don't know who he is. And I used to, think, and then I used to think, oh, is he a relation of Vicky Wickham? And of course, Vicky Wickham was the person behind Ready Steady Go. Ready Steady Go. Yeah. And uh, but no, I know I don't think the relations at all. Just uh, two Brits, obviously. Yeah. And uh, and the amazing thing to me was that he was still around and still involved with Warner Brothers years and oh, years later. Oh, he's the guy. Who signed, I think he signed a hard, didn't he? Uh-huh. I mean, that's pretty fantastic to have that. Would, 
Wasn't he also Bob uh, when he died? That Bob Stanley posted something about him on Twitter saying that you know he was involved with Saint Etienne. Uh, you know, it. yes, oh, he went right through. You know, a really long career, and uh, and I'm amazed that there hasn't been a book. I think it's I times. know. I think so too. I think a movie. I like the idea of this guy just 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 falling through life like uh, like a, like a hot knife through butter. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah, wearing some sensational clothes at the time, I'm sure. Yes, all the yeah, look very groovy, very groovy indeed. Yeah, so, you look great, Andy Wickham. Rest in peace. You're listening to the Word Podcast, where the time is whenever you want it to be. So, any other business joined by Alex Geld? I discovered something this morning. I've just been reminded of something this morning that really gets my goat in pop music. Okay, that something that I just it's the return of what gets my goat. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what gets do you know what gets my goat in pop music and particularly in hip hop music? Okay, it's what I think we can all agree is an abomination. The skit track. Yes. Oh, okay. are we are we you're aware well, I'm holding up a copy of De La Soul is Dead? Yeah, which is a wonderful record, except for the fact that it's interrupted round about every three tracks. By a skit where members of De La Soul um, go through some comic routine, which no doubt seemed absolutely hilarious to them back in the day. God, that did does it. wear thin very quickly, doesn't it? This is 1991, so okay, that that's 30 years, 30 top 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and so you don't want to hear it 30 years later. You didn't want to hear it two weeks later after it had come out, you know, and see it's still there. And I was just reading about it this morning. And, um, you know, what happened to the skit track? Because there was a, a long period of in, in, in hip-hop history when everybody did this for a while. Nobody does it anymore. Do you know why? Streaming. Streaming has killed the skit track. Because it's a really bad idea. Yeah, because put something in the middle of your stream because it streaming, made people stop. They kill streaming, is, there. streaming is killed the skit track. Is that the new one by the Buggles? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a good name for this podcast, though. That's excellent. So yeah. sorry, I just got that off my chest. I hate the skit track, and I'm stuck with it. And it's 30 years later. Isn't that absolutely amazing? How long it's been since the, the glory days of Dallas Last Hell, 30 wow. years ago. So what other, any other business have we, have we got to tell people about? Obviously on June the 18th. 18th. Yep. Which is, which is Paul McCartney's 80th birthday. Um, I know this week it was also the 80th birthday of Roger Chapman of family. Yeah. Well, yeah they're celebrated, but you know. I, I was, uh, I raised a One of whose tracks, Dave, and you must mention this, is on your upcoming 70s deep cuts. Uh, uh, on, my, on my deep 70s four CD compilation, which is coming out uh, soon, uh, family are represented by uh, my wonderful track, uh, My Friend the Sun. Uh, from uh, from the album Bandstand. Anyway, we always uh, we always carry a torch with Roger Chapman, but we certainly carry a torch with Paul McCartney, whose 80th birthday it is on June the 18th. And to mark this event, we'll be holding a special. We're calling it Paul McCartney's birthday party in Holland Park, London. Yeah. Uh, and so tickets are are on sale. We'd love to see as many as pos as possible of you there. And we'll be announcing who who we got appearing, talking, uh, performing, whatever. And there may be a musical interlude as well at one point, possibly involving a ukulele. We don't yeah, know. Yeah, poss possibly involving know. a ukulele. It's a, it, it's, it's a thought. And so, if you if people wanted to find tickets for that, what would they do, Alex? There will be a, a link in the show notes, and you can also go to wiyelondon.com. There will be a big ticket widget on the homepage. Okay. Where are you, Alex? You're in Miami, aren't you? I'm in swing in Miami, yeah, for the, for the, for the final time. Well, not what, ever. What, you're home, what, you're what, back in about a week, aren't you? I am, yeah. I fly home on Easter Sunday. And yeah. uh, I'm kind of cooked, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm missing cooking and washing up and really weird domestic stuff. I'm missing washing up. Miss. God, so, you uh, there you story? go, ladies and gentlemen. Alex Geld is missing washing up. So if you've got a pile of washing up at home that you want doing, just we'll get in touch. I'm your man. 
if you're a pa- <laughs> if you're a Patreon supporter, he'll do it. It's not a not a problem at all. Part of the service. You've got to su- subscribe to the crockery tier, though. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by the Word. 